passed down a, a judgment asking uh, that the Election Commission arrange for re-election in two of the constituencies for the National Assembly in Pakistan, NA125 and NA155, both um, in and around the cantonment area in Lahore. Uh, both those decisions were made upon petitions filed by the losing candidates from Pakistan Tehrike in South in the May 2013 polls. Um, this has led to a uh, massive uproar and uh, a, a detailed discussion has begun again whether PTIs struggle uh, throughout this time. All the, the, the media discussion, the, the dharnas in Islamabad, etc. were actually rightly guided and if you know, there were, then where to from here? I'll begin the show by introducing my two guests and we'll try and delve into the discussion surrounding this arena and try and broaden it into the horizon of Pakistani politics generally. To my left, uh, a regular guest of the show, Majid Iqbal, a community activist, blogger, writer and speaker. Welcome to Community Platform. Thank you for having me. And to my right, representing uh, what is a, a undoubtedly a joyous day for Pakistan Tehreek in South, is the former General Secretary of PTI Yorkshire, Mr. Shajil Malik. Welcome to Community Platform, sir. Thank you. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum as -salam. Let me begin by going straight to the judgment then. Um, the tribunal sitting um, found that both the elections uh, in those uh, constituencies did not hold the, um, the requisite uh, clarity or the uh, order that is required for a decent election so that you can uh, elect candidates fairly. Does this justify a PTI's position over the past, well, two years now, since May 2013? Well, uh, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Uh, yes, uh, I definitely think it does, because uh, uh, we believe from, the, from day one that the elections have been rigged and there were uh, sufficient proofs available, uh, which we have already provided. And obviously, there are further proofs on the way. Um, we have believed as a party, well, our leader and uh, the party has believed that the backbone of any, uh, any country is the parliament of that country. And if you can't uh, even have uh, uh, the, the right system in electing the parliament, then there is no way that you will move the, the nation in the right direction. And that is why we uh, certainly, uh, in spite of uh, maybe we might have accepted the results, uh, but we wouldn't accept the results because we believe that the nation has to move in the right direction. And well, allow me to play, sorry, allow me to play the, the, the devil's advocate, as it were. Actually, what the, well, the, the detailed 80-pay judgment was released yesterday, and I've, I've had the, the displeasure of going through it all. Yeah. What they've said in detail is that there is no evidence of any rigging on behalf of Khwaja Saad Rafiq or Mia Nasir, the two PMLN um, you know, members of parliament removed from positions. And the reason why both elections are annulled is due to irregularities in essence, what could be termed staff incompetence, is that not a, A, actually it goes against what the Hariki Saf has been saying, and B, is that not something that probably happens in every single constituency in Pakistan, that staff are not up to the standard? Well, even if that is the case, still, it is wrong. We have to have, in, to go in the right direction, we have to have the elections uh, conducted properly. Uh, Yes, you're right. It has not uh, blamed Khwaja Saad Rafiq Saab. Uh, or even the election com uh, officials. It's saying that none of the election officials involved, any of them were involved in rigging. Yes. But basically, there were failings in maintaining order and regularity, which shouldn't, shouldn't really... Be. Well, it's not, yes. it's not an ideal situation, but it doesn't point to dishonesty. It points to incompetence. Well, it, it, this, this battle has just started, and I think nobody would like... Uh, to be blamed in this. Obviously, Khwaja Saad Rafiq Saab will want uh, uh, not to be blamed. 
the returning officers will not want to be blamed. The election commission will not want to be blamed. But somebody has to be blamed here. If it's an incompetency of the election commission, and this is very serious incompetency. But apart from that, I mean, how could you say that one in six votes, that's the ratio that they're saying, are uh, votes that cannot be verified? i.e. it means that uh, they were either rigged or the system is so flaunted that... Uh, <laughs> it's, 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 it, it dare me to then suggest that it's probably more the second one than the first because the way in which rigging happens in Pakistan hmm. is a lot more blunt and a lot less subtle. In essence, the, the thing that you pointed to between 15 and 20% of votes being hmm. you know, broadly termed bogus was to do with their... Uh, being uh, the ability to identify them with Nadra's national database. Mm. That's, that's where the irregularity was. And given that, uh, you know, okay, maybe Lahore does not suffer as much as the rural areas, but generally speaking, given that not everybody in Pakistan will be documented and uh, on the mm. systems, you know, in, in the way that, you know, either Nadra or government or parliament would like, uh, yes. that, that failing, again, is probably a systemic issue. What's, what's the, what the key thing here is, is that nobody has been held liable for deliberately and dishonestly rigging the elections. Uh, yes, I mean, this, this has not been... Uh, I mean, the case is yet to go to the Judicial Commission. Uh, it hasn't come out from the Judicial Commission. This is uh, a statement by uh, the election uh, tribunal. Yes. So it is yet to go to the Judicial Commission. We will see. We are providing furthermore evidences. Uh, you can't say that one in six, I mean, six times a vote has been, uh, has, been, uh, has been casted. You can't say that that was just a mistake. I mean, yes, uh, um, the tribunal has said that. I mean, they don't want to blame anyone at this very particular time. But Pakistan Tariq and South is not going to accept that. I mean, we are They've going to go further. They've both your petitions, so actually both judgments are in your favor. Yeah. Let me bring in Majid at this point then. Is the, uh, you know, starting off on, on a similar vein, is the decision an exoneration of PTI's position? And does it point towards a, a brighter beginning for Pakistani politics? Well, these type of voter, voting irregularities is not nothing new. Um, PTI obviously started off their campaign uh, claiming that the um, elections had been rigged and therefore they feel that they're going to boycott and basically move on and protest. Um, since that then, I mean, since the protests have finished, I mean, has there been enough uh, out there in terms of trying to create that climate for moving forward, <coughs> progressing forward Pakistan into a new phase? I don't believe that's been the case there. And that's because um, politics in Pakistan is, is more than just casting a vote in a ballot box. And this is a stark reality of this. The power structures in Pakistan are more powerful than the ordinary voter who goes from village, from village or to a city to cast their vote believing that this party would, or any party would, bring about a credible form of change within the country itself there then. So um, it's not nothing new, this is the thing. I mean, people in Pakistan are used to this style of politics, uh, village politics, you know, block voting, in itself, it, 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 you can count that as, you know, a, a type of election fraud where uh, uh, an yes. entire community, an entire village is being forced to vote for particular candidates, which will then have, you know, a majority when it comes to parliament itself there then. Let, let's keep this going then, that's the same point. And I could provide anecdotal evidence, but it's almost never strong enough. But in, in the constituency from which my family hail back home, the person who was representing Pakistan Tariq in South was a two-time former uh, uh, People's Party, both national and provincial minister. Mm -hmm. um, has PTI not had to basically play the game of everybody else uh, in that they've had to bring on board people that we keep terming in Pakistan electables? Mm. Um, and that's one of the key reasons why it's gained traction because some of these people hold safe seats that their, you know, their families and their, their tribes are always going to win. And if that is the case, which a lot of people may argue it is, is that not, as Majid says, a different form of you know, moral or ethical uh, election corruption? Is it merely just you know, ticking the wrong box or a box too many times in, in the election? Or does the entire campaign, should, should the focus be on, on, on all of it? Yeah. 
I mean, there are two, two things. One, what, is Maj what Majid is saying. I mean, I fully agree with him. Our country, even, even people who have come to this country in democracy, they still believe in Baradari system, and they still believe in personalities and following the personalities. I mean, that is uh, unfortunately the way uh, I think our older generation was brought up. But I think that is changing now. Even in Pakistan, it is changing. Uh, we have seen for the first time that the people who never even used to bother to cast their votes have actually come out to say, well, we want a change. I mean, this is exactly what has happened in Lahore. I don't think that we realize as much as the people of uh, NA125 uh, realize. And, and we're talking about uh, elderly, we're talking about young girls, we're talking about young boys who are coming out, sitting in a dharna. Uh, Hamid Khan Saab, who was the uh, losing candidate yeah. in that constituency, he said that, you know, I, I requested those people, you know, it's really hot, why don't you go home, have some rest, and then come back maybe for two three hours a day and they just refuse say what this is not for you we have come out we've come out to change the system so it has changed uh, for the first time we have had people in Karachi in the recent elections where people have come out and and been able to vote freely unlike previous uh, but times when that, that, that has never majority, happened but um, you you we shifting the discussion slightly I'll, I'll bring it back but very very quickly on the point that you just made People have come out independently without fear, as Imran Khan said, we've broken the, the shackles of fear yeah. in NA246 in Karachi, and MQM's majority increased. Well, there are various reasons. I, I don't want to go, I mean, that's a discussion on its own, I mean, a separate yeah. discussion altogether. What I'm saying is, do, can we break the shackles merely by pointing to the fact that enthusiasm and zeal exists amongst the people? I don't think anybody would deny that, that mm. people want a change in Pakistan, they're yeah. agitating for it. Yeah. But... Are we really changing anything if, like I said, if PTI also has to bring in electables and PTI also doesn't ever say that maybe in KPK there were irregularities and incompetent election commission officials well, as well? Well, bring it out if there is. No, what we, I'm we, saying is, basically, if election commission, I'm not as we're saying, has a structural problem, yeah. that will be throughout the country. It won't just be in Lahore. Yeah, well, no, I'm not denying at all, or I'm not saying that there weren't any discrepancies in KPK. There might have been. I mean, let's be honest about it. I don't want to say that we are all angels and, and the rest of them are all devils. No, that is not the case. Well, if there is, bring it out. Let's, let's, let's change it. And this is why the struggle, I think, for the first time in the history of Pakistan, somebody has come out for dharna. Now, we all know it's not easy to sit outside on road. Jumat Islami used to throw over governments throughout the 90s with dharnas. <laughs> Well, that, well, I don't know. There, there was a different type. This one is definitely a different type. Uh, it's much but more. But this one also didn't uh, lead to the fall of the government. 127 days, uh, Imran Khan and all, you know, vast uh, swaths of PTI supporters, you know, sat on both in the capital and in major cities on the roads, blocking, you know, uh, a lot of life saying, no, this is our right. We're going to make a change. Is that, is that not in, it, in of itself? a big enough symbolic gesture that maybe Pakistan can change and is heading towards a change? I think you've got to congratulate anybody who goes out in Pakistan and you know, puts out a certain effort, whatever group party that they're from, and um, they can you know, have it out for so many days and believe that whatever they're doing is going to bring about a viable change. Yeah. Uh, so zeal, passion, I mean Pakistanis have never you know, been short of that, especially when it comes <laughs> to supporting the cricket team and getting behind, you know, uh, even though they're the losing team all the time. The fact is there's zeal, there's passion there all the time. There's a, a new world that we're living in at the moment, yeah. a globalized world. They see effects happening in the Middle East. They see changes happening in other parts of the world, and they believe they, they can do it as well there then. So the dynamics of the world arena have changed. And therefore, a new generation, which is rising up now, you know, wants to um, look out for a new style of politics. Wants to say, right, okay, if in the West they can do this, why can't we do this over here? Yeah. If they can have... Um, I can't remember the campaign, you know, where they were kind of against Wall Street. Um, yeah. Uh, I can't remember the name now. Th thanks for making my mind go blank yeah. as well. But, but yes. But, you know, uh, if they can do it, if young, you know, uh, educated, you know, folk can come out and do this, uh, have the zeal, the passion to challenge, you know, capitalism, you know, why can't we do that inside Pakistan itself there then? We live here, we want that change to happen. So that, fine, that's not a problem there. But even then, we need to look beyond this in terms of what is exactly the details of this change. How different is it to the change which other parties have promised? Uh, what are the, the, the details of this in terms of, right, okay, we're going to have a change. We've got a charismatic personality in front of us. 
on day one in terms of power, what's going to happen? What's going to change? Uh, in terms of policies, what are the details of these policies? Again, there's lots of generalizations that we've seen uh, no, put out forward there. Don't the generalizations sound pretty good that basically we're not going to be dishonest, we're not going to be liars like the, the rest of them, we're not going to uh, rob the country, we're not going to uh, stash away our wealth abroad, we're not going to basically come in and try and make as much money as we can in five years because we're going to be out in opposition next time. We're not going to basically succumb to uh, American whims and demands when it comes to drone tax. All of these things may sound very general and yeah. maybe you can argue does Imran Khan A have the power, will he have the power, does he have the correct policies, that's a secondary issue. But those things on a primary basis, can you see why they sound good to people though? They sound good, um, but looking even from the track record point of view, uh, as somebody who's independent from any party in Pakistan, uh, any mainstream political parties, uh, when I, whenever I've looked at what, what's been happening over the last decade, uh, there's been uh, different movements, uh, so different uh, moves made by Imran Khan, which to be honest I think, don't think have really worked out well. So, for example, when Musharraf came into power, sitting down with him and saying, right, okay, we can maybe work together. Um, you mentioned earlier, earlier on about the, the shift of, of, of um, people from other parties who thought, right, okay, the careers are finished there. There's really no more traction there. Imran Khan is kind of the next train. Oh, maybe because Imran Khan's on an upswing. Yeah, he's on a, the, the train is going ahead, he's getting popularity. Maybe it's a time to move, move to, this, to, to this particular movement there. Um, and these are the, the type of individuals who've like slept around with other parties, to be honest. Yeah. It's very much an a, a opportunist, um, you know, looking for the next uh, kind of like um, uh, next move to, you know, win themselves in positions next where they can have influence. Type, yes. So I think a lot of these issues, people have begun to question these things. The positions, for example, on Afia Siddiqui have been, you know, fluctuating. Before it was on the placards, you know, right, we're going to challenge uh, American, you know, uh, domination in, in our lands. Uh, they've taken one of our citizens, she needs to be brought back we need to try under our own courts if she's guilty of anything. Again, that was dropped as well there then. So there's pretty much been an experimental change. And for a lot of people, I don't think that's kind of weighty enough to see, okay, if he does gain power, if the party does gain power uh, in the future, uh, and he does become prime minister, there's not necessarily going to be any significant change. It pretty much is whichever way the wind blows, whichever way the opinion is in the country, he will have to end up following that. If that means sitting down and negotiating with America and still allowing America to have presence inside Pakistan through their multiple CIA bases there, the fact that you know, independent human rights uh, organizations have verified that people have been abducted till this day you know, for years and then and, and are their whereabouts are unknown, um, this may continue. <clears throat> Mm. And the fact is, he will then have to then uh, come onto the negotiating table with other, uh, other, other parties as well to take a Let me pick up that, that last point, and obviously the, the broader uh, thing raised here, which is that basically, with all the, the, the good intention and sincerity, and I don't think you'll find many, even those who disagree with him and his policies, I don't think you'll find many who say that Imran Khan is not well-intentioned or sincere towards mm. Pakistan. But with all that well-intentioned and sincerity that he has, basically the shifting of positions shows somebody slowly moulding to the political arena. Um, in essence, there are many who may say that that is a positive thing, that basically he's learning politics. He's becoming a siyasat dan, as they say. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know if you're familiar with it, but I suspect you will be. But around about election time, uh, a very uh, notable Pakistani you know, columnist and TV speaker, Harun Rashid. Harun Rashid. He'd, been a, uh, he'd been a vociferous supporter of Imran Khan up until that point. Mm. And he, he basically became an opponent and started criticizing. And his big criticism was, Imran Khan is sincere and honest, etc. But he's not astute enough. He can't play politics. Yeah. Well, slowly, maybe he's learning. Is Majid's point then valid that there are powers that be that everybody knows in Pakistan who mm. pull the strings behind governments it is not, it's not necessarily a civil government's policy to allow America to be where it is. Mm. Can Imran Khan really deliver on some of these promises or is it just you know, political rhetoric to gain power when in reality he knows, for example, that major parts of the foreign policy he will have no power over? Is he playing the politics? No, I think that is one of the reasons he's not prime minister today because he does not want to uh, give in his power. He says, well, if I become the prime minister, I mean, we all know that I think 
he was offered a position of prime ministership a long time ago, Under which, Musharraf, yes. which, he, which he refused. I mean, that was one of the reasons. And even uh, joining Musharraf, as you said in, in your conversation earlier, he, he's, he did confess that that was one of my biggest mistakes I made. I, even though that I don't think it was, given the time and, and situ uh, situation at the time, I don't think it was maybe one of his big, biggest mistakes. But For a he, Democrat, it's a it's, big mistake. It's, it is, but uh, from what I remember, the, pop, the people of Pakistan at that time thought that, uh, you know, we need a change. But that's why leaders stand out. Yeah. My, my, my point here would be, that even, should have come even to your phony Democrats, yeah. as you might say, yeah. you know, your PPPs and your PMLNs, the people who are the, the product of the status quo and uphold the status quo, yeah. even they opposed him. So for yeah. a party that didn't really have like, you know, MPs to protect the, the, or ministries my, to protect. Well, well, that's my personal view, what I just said. But uh, Imran Khan did confess that it was one of my biggest mistakes that he, he made. As far as Afia Siddiqui is concerned, you know, we, we still have the same stance. Absolutely no change in that. We have still the same stance against America that there should be no American or foreign intervention in Pakistan. We are a democratic sovereign country. So there is absolutely no way we're going to accept that. Uh, I, I don't think anyone has spoken out against America and their intervention in, in Pakistan as much as PTI or Imran Khan has. He has, he has a very low standard to meet though, let's be fair, because the, the others don't speak out against America ever. <laughs> so, so he has a very low threshold to meet in that. Yeah. But, but the, the point still remains that, okay, with all that sincerity and all that you know, rhetoric and all those speeches, can Imran Khan really wield the power to make the big changes whilst the system remains in place, where we all know that there are powers who control what goes on, regardless of who's in government. Well, this is for something for the people of Pakistan to decide. I mean, that is why the, he keeps on quoting the same thing again and again, that uh, Allah Ta'ala does not change the fate of any nation until the people themselves decide. This is what he decides. He, he has been quoting again and again. Yes, it is the people who will have to decide. They have to come out. This is what we've been trying to do for the last two years, or well, more than two years now. Uh, I think if uh, the system changes, democratic system changes, people are given the, uh, the surety and the security that once uh, you vote, you will be able to change the nation and your fate, then I think people will vote for PTI because they do believe that it is a leadership that is honest and, and that is how we can uh, find our right all, direction. All revolutionary changes in the history of mankind, uh, if we start with you know, the Prophet Sallallahu or you look at yes. any of the other major you know, revolutions, so-called, or even the creation of Pakistan, if you like, mm. they've been forced by movements from outside of the system. Hot, I don't think anybody in their fair and just an you know, objective mind would say that revolutionary changes, fundamental changes are brought about by working within a system. Can you see why some might criticise his approach that he's trying to go through a parliament mm. that we know is corrupt to its core and has been since its inception? Mm. Yeah, I know. But, but the thing is, if you stay out, there's a problem. If you go in, there's a problem. There is, there is no easy way out. Unfortunately, we live in a country uh, which, is, uh, which is very corrupt. Uh, whichever department you go or wherever you go in the country, there is corruption there and it is very difficult. You have pointed out very rightly, I fully agree, and a lot of people agree with you. I, even being in the party, I would say that there have been people allowed in the party who uh, shouldn't have been. But the thing is that leadership, there's a central executive committee, CEC, who sit down and think about these things over and over again. You and I know for 18 years, Khan Saab has been trying his best to somehow bring in people who will bring a change and, and, and not be involved in any type of... Um, okay, well, before, you know, I, before I bring Majid in, yeah, no, yeah. I understand that, but very, before I bring Majid in, very briefly, so are you tacitly admitting that he's had to compromise some of those positions to allow people he wouldn't really want to see in his party? I think the party overall has had the view now that if we think that somebody honest will come out of nowhere and bring a change, it's not going to happen. What we will have to do is compromise with the best people available in the, in the, in the, in the country. But Imran Khan came out of nowhere. 
And well, you know, how we many Imran Khans do you have? We don't need that many, do we as leaders? Well, how many Imran Khans will we have? I mean, we're talking about people with talent, we're talking about people with determination, we're to about talking about people who are talented and honest at the same time. How many? How many have you got? I mean, what examples have you got? I mean, is, I'm is, being honest here. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Is Pakistan more dishonest and more corrupt than the rest of the world? Well, there is that joke about Pakistan that they were counted, they were they rated as the most corrupt country. Nigeria was second, so they bribed them if they can come yeah, to the first so place. They move to first place yeah. <laughs> so there's that joke there. It has that reputation. Um, I think that's a. It's a product. The Pakistan that we know today is a product of all the years of politics, and that's what it's come to at the moment. So we can't say inherently people are corrupt because that's yeah. a, a wrong perspective to give. You know, we've got the ability to make the choices of good, bad, uh, between good and evil. Um, and it's the environment that shapes people. Yeah, and it's the environment which has shaped people. So the police officer isn't inherent, inherently corrupt, yeah. who will bribe an individual, who will ask for bribes from individuals, because his, his living wage is, is not suitable enough. Um, then you gotta go further down from that and question, okay, why the wage is so low inside Pakistan for these type of you know uh, people in these positions where you know they're supposed to be representing the law within the country. And likewise, you carry on going down, and you'll find that you know, there's a bankruptcy in the economic policies of the country, okay, which themselves are you know, uh, designed by, uh, by those who are sat in parliament, and to be honest, they don't give due regard to any of the population. So, uh, when it comes to the IMF, it's like every single loan is taken out, blindfolded. Yeah. Yeah, here we are, we'll take a PMLN look. PMLN promised not to and did it within the first six months of that's coming right, to government. Yeah. And that's the problem there. I mean, they don't understand the impact of, or they do understand, and obviously it's self styled centered politics where it's about themselves and about the dynasties and their families and their parties, and unfortunately, that's, that's it. But, you know, all these issues have an effect upon the common man of Pakistan. So, mm -hmm. where Pakistan is today is a product of all the years of politics. They've had everybody, to be honest, haven't they, really? Yeah. They've had dictatorships, they've had military. Uh, leadership they've had left wing, uh, right wing, everybody, yeah. yeah, democratic dynasties that they call it. Everybody they've had on 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 the on the table there, and it really hasn't progressed. Um, there's a massive gap between the rich and the poor. You can go into the rural areas, and literally you have tears inside your eyes of the state and the condition, the way the people are living in. Yeah. But so, you you've got to admit this, uh, Adnan and Majid, that mainstream parties, maybe in Pakistan, are three. Uh, which are Pakistan People's Party, Pakistan Muslim League, and, and Pakistan Tariq and Saf. Right now. Yeah, right yeah. now, at this very moment. But you look at the leadership of these, and you will, uh, without any doubt, come to a conclusion very soon that PTI leadership is the most honest leadership, without any doubt. You have people, the leadership, who have declared for the first time ever in the, I think, in the, in the, in the history of Pakistani politics, where the politicians have actually assets. declared their assets on the website of the, uh, of the political party. So, but is that that's all and fine, but it's not a case of like putting every single politician to a lie detector test. It's the fact that every one of us today in Pakistan is a product of all the politics that's been going on. And therefore, as Adnan, I think, was from, uh, kind of like uh, one of the questions that he posed to himself is, can we not think beyond this? Can we not think beyond the ballot box? Can we not think outside of the current framework? Is democracy the only route for change? Is democracy the only formula for that country to run and stand on its own feet and be able to be self-sufficient? And the fact is, you know, we should think beyond this. This is my view. Mm -hmm. We should, uh, you know, look at... Uh, Again, this is where I made a uh, disagree with you know, PTI from the point of view that it's a secular party. And fundamentally, from the belief of Islam, we believe that Islam has a role in individual life and political life, in economic life, in judicial life, in the social life, in deciding you know, foreign policy, domestic policy, to shaping the, the laws in the countries in terms of the economics, the finance, um, and how these are structured and how, this, how these should function. We sincerely believe from the Islamic point of view that there is a, there is a case may, there. May I, before I bring Malik Saab in on this very point then, may I then suggest that I, I, I would say that there's evidence, at least rhetorical evidence, to the contrary where, you know, Imran Khan's made statements, the brother pointed to the, the ayat of the Quran that, yeah. you know, Imran Khan keeps quoting. He, he made a speech in Karachi uh, when he was having his, you know, national jalsa tour at the time, as it were, and he said, we're going to set up the six Khilafah Rashda here, etc. And he will claim that his you know, inspiration and his morality and his ideas about life, etc. come from the Qur'an and from Islam. Mm -hmm. Maybe he hasn't understood like, whatever it is that you're saying you know, of Islam. But surely to say that you know, he's secular, 
Can you, can you argue that he's deliberately secular or do you think it's a confusion or it's an accident? I mean, George Bush claimed he was like a, you know, a devout Christian but, yeah. you know, and believed that you know, God told him to you know, declare war on Iraq. Yeah. You know, how seriously can you take some of these statements? So I'm not trying to question you know, people's individual personal lives and their relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's not my, my, my uh, approach here. What I'm trying to say is from the outset, I can see okay, Islam as a policy, when we look at the uh, Quran and Sunnah, which shapes uh, one of the two canons of law, which shape you know, how laws are, uh, are devised and structured, one of them is about privatization. And Islam doesn't believe that you know, uh, as, uh, um, utilities like gas, water and, and electricity should be privatized. Now that view is you know, something which PTI may say, okay, you know, we don't mind multinational corporations come in and privatizing the water, the electricity. For us, you know, from where already we are at the moment, we are literally have our hands tied at the back with multinational corporations who are coming in, taking over our utility, which Musharraf said, well, if you can't look after them ourselves, we might sell them off then. This was the policy. Mm. Uh, and since then, we've been suffering. And even before that, the fact is um, that style of, uh, kind of uh, that particular you know, uh, view of, of how you know, assets should be you know, dealt with is you know, fundamentally at odds with the Islamic policy. Islam would consider it as fundamentally haram for multinational corporations to come and own these assets. So no individual can own these, nobody can privatize them, therefore the state ownership and therefore they are the one who should regulate them. And a lot of this issue could be you know, uh, dealt with the electricity crisis, you know, the Bohran which they continue to talk about. According to Punjabi University, there's e- you know, enough electricity that can gener- be generated from you know, coal, from just below Pakistan itself. Pakistan has the second largest coal field in the world. In it, it could be done. It could be done there. And therefore, you know, if we still rely upon privatization, that's never going to happen. Because somebody else would come in and would dig up the coal and for us. And would want to make money. And would want to make the money. That money gets shipped outside of the country, it doesn't stay within the country itself. And they're in charge of you know, how the, uh, the utilities are run inside the country. Mm-hmm. Again, it's fractured. So what I'm trying to say is that secular politics is, is at odds with Islamic politics. Um, and that's why I really do believe that people really need to understand Islam in a lot more detail than just mere slogans itself. So you can quote, like, you know, um, you know, it becoming Khilafah Rashida. However, that's off the back of movements within Pakistan today who have been calling for Khilafah within Pakistan. That there's an opinion out there amongst the army, amongst the uh, educated elite, amongst the bankers, amongst the common person who ra- view, okay, ra- okay, there are moments who are talking about this type of change. is different. It's different to the politics that they used to, which is simply on, on merit of an individual in terms of their personality, or simply, we won't have a change. Be any change, you know. We're, we're going to kind of put our, you know, uh, uh, we'll put all our rupees on this person. Okay, you go forward and make that change for us there. Then, let me right. two, two points. One's a very broad one. Mm-hmm. One's a more specific one. Uh, the broad one being, you know, springing onto what Majid said. There was an Economist poll two or three years ago. Economist, a very, you know, large international journal publication, which basically uh, polled. Uh, youth across the Muslim world, a variety, and 83% second on the chart behind Egypt. 83% of Pakistan's youth, when asked if they would want the implementation of Islam as their system, mm-hmm. said yes. Mm-hmm. Whether they all understood what that means or not is a separate <laughs> issue. Mm-hmm. And so that, that's the first one. Shouldn't that be the struggle that Imran Khan is part of? And the second one, you know, uh, adding to the, the coal issue. Uh, there was a huge uproar and a lot of discussion around uh, the, the gold mines at Rekordek, which were given to, I think, a Chilean firm to mine. And mm. Pakistan, the figures you know, fluctuated on this, but Pakistan was supposed to get 2.5% of the earnings of that extraction after it had been shipped off in its you know, all state, clean, and you know, sold on the international markets. Can we live with... A, a system that is not Islamic, the general question, and B, can we live with more specifically things which are un-Islamic that we've copied from other countries and nations who we wrongly deem to be Islamic, whether it be Turkey or Malaysia, who we keep drawing inspiration from. Mm. Can, can a Muslim society survive like this with that schizophrenia? Well, I don't know what really secularism is. I mean, some people say Islam is secular religion as well. I mean, which believes that every religion in itself, uh, in, in their territory under their administration, will live freely. Uh, we are a secular nation because our religious problems are uh, to, well, a lot. Uh, 
too much. Uh, we have within our, uh, you know, when we talk about Islamic rule or Sharia rule, and there are different uh, interpretations by different uh, sects of Islam. So who is it going to be? Is it going to be Al Al Tashi? Is it going to be Al Sunni? Is it going to be Wahhabi? Is it going to be somebody else? So it's a lot more complicated than just. Uh, uh, than just uh, uh, saying that we are going to become an Islamic nation. It is something that I don't think even our ulama are going to agree on. I think we have to take things gradually on its own. We are Islamic Republic of Pakistan. There is absolutely no doubt about it. When it comes to concepts like secularism, uh, people have different views about it. I mean, for us, I think as a nation, it's just simple as that. We'd like to keep religion out out of politics. Out of politics. Okay, well, let, because let, let, me, let me try and clarify that point yeah. then. Let me ask you a question. What percentage, not just of a parliament, but what percentage of humanity would you say would need to vote in favor to make, say, alcohol not haram or legal? What percentage in Pakistan? Or oh, what? yeah, let's just say Pakistan. How much of Pakistan needs to vote one way to make alcohol legal? Well, I, I don't think anybody will agree to that. They won't agree yeah. to it, but what I'm saying yeah. is, and you know, you're answering the question, inadvertently, and so I'll lead on to the actual mm. question, which is, you're not going to put a percentage on that because you're saying that it's a clear cut prohibition in Islam. Yes. So Muslims, it doesn't matter if 100% of the country says this is legal, it won't become legal in Islam. Yes, of course. Will secularism and religion and religious identity not clash repeatedly then when you have a system of making laws and administering laws and you know all, all of the system to do with how society is run which doesn't take direct guidance or does not allow direct meddling from the belief with which people live on a day-to-day -day basis okay let me let me put it in this way I mean <laughs> when we go into minute details obviously we're gonna fight over everything every little thing the, the, the when we say keep religion out that would probably mean the differences that we have keep them out oh, absolutely. it does not mean that we don't follow the basic religion we will stay as Muslims when you talk about alcohol the Christians or the non-Muslims are allowed to drink in in Pakistan they have brewery there is very popular Murray. Uh, Murray Murray brewery. brewery there are people who are freely allowed to drink they are freely allowed to practice their religion their church is there their synagogues uh, in Pakistan so yes uh, that does not mean that we're leaving our religion no not at all how how come you point to all the religion just differences that we speak of hmm. you know and this is a very favorite topic of a lot of the media in Pakistan even you know throwing up the, these alleged differences between people hmm. I say alleged because why is it that these differences whether they're between Muslim and non-Muslim hmm. or within Muslims you know hmm. Sunni Shia etc why have they intensified over the last 15 years and when has Islam had a chance to rule Pakistan to be able to blame Islam for it why are we not blaming secularism for it? Because secularism has ruled Pakistan since 1947. Every single yes. government that came into power, whatever yeah. it understood of secularism, whether it was you know, clean or not, mm. is a separate issue. But none of them claim to be a, a khilaf and on, on the footsteps of Umar or Abu Bakr or Uthman or Ali. None of them ever claim this. They all claim to be elected prime ministers or dictators who were basically looking after, taking care until you could have a prime minister. Yes. They were all secular. Why don't we blame them for all the murder between inter-religion and intra-religious? Well, it's, it's a discussion we can, <laughs> we can blame. I mean, we, I, I think the main idea of PTI is that whether we call ourselves secular or Islamic, the main thing is we have worries which are far beyond much uh, more serious to take care of. And this is, this is one of the things that we believe we have a system which is uh, a democratic system of elections. I mean, it is in no way we can say that it is un-Islamic. There's nothing un Oh no, electing the leader. Okay. Nobody will disagree yeah. with you that electing a leader pop by popular choice. Yes. You can take various yes. methods of it. There's not, no issue with that. What, what yeah. he, you know, Majid is taking issue with is A, the uh, un-Islamic policies instituted, such as privatization, where people don't even realize it's actually un-Islamic, unless yeah. you go and study Islamic economic history. And B, the idea that people are given the power to make laws by a majority hmm. and you basically relying upon people's good instincts to not make un-Islamic laws. So for example, Pakistani hmm. banks stealing interest 
And that was yeah. a law made by and enshrined in our constitution. Yeah. And people keep trying to say that it's an Islamic constitution. And that's what Can I you believe. see the problem? That's why I believe there's a clash there. There's a clash of paving that political path forward. So, as you mentioned, religion is very strong. So if you study all opinion polls, the Gallup opinion poll, which we've just done, a few years back in many, many countries, the University of Maryland, they did opinion polls, again questioning people about Islam and Sharia rule, mm. not just Islam in the, in the house, but on Sharia rule, on unification. Yeah. So, you know, how Muslims view affairs in, in uh, other Muslim countries, wouldn't you like to unify these countries? Very, very, you know, topical and key questions, mm. because they understand the dynamics, you see. These are people who do these opinion polls, they've looked at history, they've looked at what the Muslim world used to look like, in the 1800s and the 1900s, early 1900s. Mm. They actually realized there was a central Islamic leadership from Turkey, mm. where even... Even the, in its demise, yeah. Even in its demise that people of the subcontinent had given bayah or bayt to mm. the ruler inside Turkey. Yeah. They very much understand the dynamics of uh, Islamic history and the way the Muslim uh, demographics have changed, especially after they've got rid of the central leadership. Yeah, which but but let's be honest. That's no, never going to come back now. No, but the thing is, that, this is why this goes to my question. Uh, my point is, this is why these they carry out these opinion polls. How much actual, how much traction has this opinion uh, now uh, gained within the Muslim world? And it's been considerable. And that's why they, you know, they talk about Sharia rule returning in a very, you know, um, uh, in in a manner which is like not befitting. Saying, oh, this is going to be quite bad for the Muslim world. There's going to be issues like what you mentioned there. Mm. Where have they got these things from? So I agree with the nod there. Mm. Islam in the last hundred years, even in Pakistan since forty-seven, hasn't had a chance to rule. Mm. Hasn't had any, you know, uh, position when it's uh, allowed to execute the Islamic laws. General Zia wasn't an Islamic rule, you know. To be honest, it was a very much of a uh, politically manufactured uh, uh, regime that was compliant with U.S. foreign policy. That had Russia. to use religion. That had to use yeah. religion. In order to, you know, uh, get the masses on board mm. to fight Russia. We, we, we yeah. haven't got long left. It's very, very, very briefly. Alam Iqbal is one of the uh, people cited as inspiration for a lot of people, but also Imran Khan repeatedly. Yes. We, shouldn't we, and I, it's based upon the last comment that you just made, which is that's never going to happen again. Shouldn't we try and look at what Alam Iqbal said about the idea of nationalism actually creating nations amongst the Muslims once he came here and studied his PhD? It's beautiful. And mm. its detail, which is, this is a weapon that the West has developed mm. to try and divide us because they cannot rule us once we're all united. But to wrap up, 30 seconds each. We've spoken briefly, we started off with a specific event of, you know, corruption and rigging, etc. Mm. Spoken about uh, Pakistan, Teddy Kinsaf. Do you see Pakistan changing for the better? And if it is, you know, what's the direction we're going to take from here? And if it isn't, what should we do? 30 seconds, very briefly, then I'll give Majid the last word. Well, I think PTI is trying its best uh, tirelessly for the last two years. Khan Saab and the whole leadership has tried to bring a change in Pakistan. We have been successful. Uh, we have had a breakthrough. We have been able to make a, a judicial commission. They have passed certain, uh, they have made some certain decisions. We have seen Khwaja Saad Rafiq's uh, being just kicked out of uh, the parliament. The real and we oh, hope yeah. that this will open up more cases and I think since parliament is the backbone of a country which, will, which is the law making uh, um, uh, body of the country, I think it is time that we do bring this change and with this change we will bring more change in Pakistan for a better Pakistan. Fantastic. Well, same question to yourself, do you, do, where do you see Pakistan heading and what does Pakistan need to do to actually get on its feet if, if that's something that you can envisage? We've got to think beyond the box, we don't need to use the ballot, we don't need to use the bullet for change. That's quite simple. What we need is a very clear, structured Islamic approach to reshaping the politics within, within Pakistan and that needs to happen independently out of the system. We don't want to work for a, uh, a system like democracy where 51 idiots could override the opinion of 49 geniuses. Okay? This is the reality. Now that conflict with Islam that I think you were alluding to earlier on, some of the rules could be damaged inside this, uh, and completely rechain the fabric of Pakistan in terms of how it was initially concepted in 1947 as being uh, working towards an Islamic state and the promise of Muslim rule and where it's got to now. So we really need to understand this uh, kind of journey that Pakistan has gone through. It has the potential to become one of the key leading states within the world. There's not even one mineral that is not available within Pakistan. In fact, um, it's one of the most uh, key countries today that America's had had to rely upon in order for them to execute the war on terror. Pakistan has the ability to do a U-turn 
on America and eject it out of the, out of the country and bring a centralized leadership which can, to be honest, unite Afghanistan, can unite Uzbekistan and the various areas around it to form a nucleus for a newly emerging power that themselves in, uh, in the, with the papers, the policy papers that are coming out from the branches of the CIA, I think it was called the NIA, they themselves predict by 2020 there'll be a radical change within that particular area. So it's not a populist opinion, you know, which is something that's kind of designed uh, out, of the, out, of the imagine, out of the imagination or it can't happen. In fact, they're predicting this type of change to happen within that particular area. I've got to say my friend Adnan is very optimistic. <laughs> it's quite a bit of young, Inshallah, young we can all be hopeful and we should always uh, keep faith in the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We've discussed, uh, as I said, uh, started off with the specific uh, event of two PMNLNs uh, sitting uh, members of National uh, Assembly being removed from their uh, positions because of irregularities in the electoral process uh, two years ago. Uh, re-elections uh, have been ordered on both of those seats. We move the discussion broader to look at PTI struggle and whether democracy in itself is where uh, the sincere and the uh, enthusiastic should be expending their energy trying to bring about a change in Pakistan. It's been a broad uh, ranging discussion. Uh, I'll be back in the near future again. Uh, I'll be Adnan Khan. I'll thank both my guests, Majid Iqbal and Shajil Malik. Uh, thank you for watching. Assalamu alaikum.